Hi everybody, welcome back to the online lending technology think tank if you've just joined us um, or if you've if, if you just um, from the last session as well, welcome to you as well. Um, just wanted to uh, uh, say hello and welcome to our next uh, episode which will look at open banking. Um, for those who've just joined us as well, um, I just want to point out the uh, platform that we use and the options that you can do to interact on this event. So have a look on the left hand side, you've got an I section, which is information around the agenda, um, log into the next session, etc. That's on there. We've also got some information on our speakers, so click on that icon. Um, information on our sponsors, uh, particularly Credit Kudos, uh, who are sponsoring this session on open banking. Uh, have a look at their information. There's also a resources section where you can download some information related to uh, some of the things we're talking about today. As well, we'd encourage you to have a look at that. You can download that during the session, or if you're watching this on demand, uh, that information is still available to, to download. So also get involved with that platform if you can. Um, also, more importantly, this, we try and make this, these sessions as interactive as we can. So as you can see, there's a, like a, a, um, a comments kind of box there. Um, if you could put your questions into there, that'd be great. We'll put this through to our chair and our um, panelists and see if we can answer those. If we don't get a chance to cover it today, we'll, we'll do a write-up next Thursday on the Credit Connect website, so have a look at that. And then also, it'd be really great to get your feedback in a number of polls that we're going to be running. Uh, that will appear across the screen throughout. Um, there's not too many. They're anonymous. Please get involved. It'd be great. We're trying to create a bit of body of work and a white paper around some of the research uh, in the industry, so that'd be great. So, as I mentioned, uh, I left enough from me. We've got some great speakers on this session on open banking. Again, it's chaired by our uh, event chair, Chris Warburton from RO Strategy. Um, I'm going to hand you over to now, over to Chris now, and we'll get the discussion uh, started. Chris, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, a lot. thanks, thanks, Colin. So, um, yeah, so so this this there've been some questions on some of the earlier sessions. So, welcome back, everyone. For those that attended around open banking. So this is the session we can obviously we'll explore some of the open banking. We've got some great experts uh, definitely on the on the call uh, on the call here today. Um, so just before we start, just a little bit about my background for those who've joined new. Uh, so my name's Chris Warburton, uh, you know, so I'm gonna chair this event. Uh, a little bit of my background, I spent sort of like, you know, over 20 years now, it's, it's more than that, um, but more than that in, in risk operations, looking after and sort of running um, you know, transforming processes across the customer lifecycle from you know, new accounts, uh, acquisitions all the way through credit inflections. Uh, so currently, uh, director of um, RO Strategy, and we're working on a series of videos, uh, really exploring some of the, the trends that, that we're seeing at the moment. So, um, so that being said, and this session here is is really on, on open banking. We're going to drill down. We've got, we've got a great bunch of people. Uh, we've got uh, Eleanor Demuth, uh, who's um, a director of risk at Curve Credit. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Owen Edwards, who's the head of lending operations at JM Bank. Uh, we've got Katie Pender, who's the uh, head of client solutions at the Target Group, and uh, Freddie Kelly, who's the CEO at uh, Credit Kudos. So, uh, so wel welcome everyone. And I don't know if we just we want to start just maybe just giving just a brief introduction uh, around what you do and what your background is a little bit, just as by way of introduction to, to this session. Um, Eleanor, do you want to go first? Sure. So I'm um, risk director for Curve Credit, which is the credit arm of Curve. Curve is a, an application to place all your money in one one easy place. Um, I've got oh, 20 years of credit risk experience and before that I, I did research into facial recognition like you do. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, i just go around that. Owen, maybe maybe go next. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm head of lending operations at JM Bank. I oversee both the collections and the lending function. Uh, we're a new UK challenger bank focused on um, fintech solutions and providing a more dynamic lending experience. Uh, my experience primarily is in collections previously. Um, I've held senior roles at the um, Building Society and Credit Card. Okay, fabulous. Uh, Katie. Hi, uh, I'm Katie Pender. I am Head of Client Solutions at Target Group. Uh, Target is a BPO and software provider. And in my role, I look for solutions for um, potential new clients and also our existing clients. Um, I have pretty much worked in the mortgage industry um, for the majority of my career and uh, I'm leading develop in development of some new and exciting products within Target. Okay. Fabulous. And lastly, uh, uh, Freddie, quick introduction, you and Credit Cures. Hi, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm founder and CEO of Credit Kudos. Um, 
really briefly, we're an open banking provider and credit reference agency. Uh, we're in the business of providing data and tools to help companies make better decisions using open banking data. Uh, my background, I'm, I'm originally a software engineer. I spent the uh, first part of my career over in the, the west coast of America building transaction analytic analytical products uh, for the US market. And, and that kind of led me naturally to open banking and, and building building credit kudos. Okay, fabulous. So so open banking, I suppose in terms of just to tee up this session, open banking has been a huge talk about uh, open banking, particularly during the pandemic, I'd say over the last sort of 12 months. I mean, it was there before. I mean, I, I know it's, it's, been, it's been around for a while, but it really feels like it's sort of, you know, been part of a lot of the new sort of digital processes that have been adopted and sort of, you know, as, as a lot as a lot more visibility. Um, I suppose for this uh, conversation, it's really around sort of, you know, where does the technology go from here? Um, what's been an experience and, you know, where, 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 do, where do we go from here, really? Um, and I suppose to start the conversation off, I suppose I wanted to talk a little bit about adoption rates. So adoption rates is always what people talk about is, you know, how widely has it been adopted and what's been the experience? Um, you know, and, you know, does it change by sector, et cetera? And, and um, I know we we're chatting with some of us beforehand just a little bit about what that looks like. I mean, and, and Anna, I know you had, you had some data and sort of views on it from from your background in terms of like, I mean, what have you seen from from adoption rates for open banking and sort of how's that changed over the last 12 months and where, where does it sit now? Well, I would say it's changed massively over just mm. the last 12 months. I mean, we're only just starting to offer credit now. We're partnering with Credit Kudos to do that. But in my previous role, uh, you know, we were quite sceptical about whether or not people would want to take up open banking. Mm. And uh, we just found it was an exponential thing once people got used to the idea of it and, and why we were doing it. Like anything else, the communication is key. Uh, pe people were, were willing to take it up. But then I think the, the COVID crisis has uh, sped up digital adoption of all kinds. And, and the acceptance of, you know, the big data is out there, so why not use it? I, I think um, we, we saw an increase overall from something like, you know, where, where open banking was an option, from something like 40% take up through to 80%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so for, and do you think so? Sometimes, like in the fintech space, an example, it become almost like a, um, almost like embedded into the acquisition process, and so you're going to sort of get higher, higher take up rates. Do you think it's? Do you think that's part of it, or do you think there's 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 something more underlying that's going on? Well, I think fintech naturally appeals to people who are relatively tech savvy and, and unafraid. Anyway, mm. you know, I think there's definitely an issue with with older people who are perhaps not as au fait with that technology or not as comfortable giving away personal information and and bank data is definitely seen as personal information even though it's anonymized mm. um, over the internet even never mind over an app mm. so I, I think there's there's a lot of acceptance that has has to be educated Hmm. rather than assumed. I, I think there is definitely a risk of financial exclusion through the use of open banking where people are not comfortable with it. Yeah. I mean, and I was going to bring in Katie here, just, just to, from, a, from a broader um, customers, customer set. I mean, what, what kind of things have you seen? I mean, similar kind of rates or smaller rates? or So certainly, um, specifically within the the our mortgage clients, we've seen a significantly hmm. lower rate. You know, um, we're not even kind of touching... 20% uptake rate and there's some various reasons for that so um, part of it is that prior to applying for a mortgage um, especially if you're a first-time buyer or even when you're remortgaging then you know the advice is to do a little bit of window dressing in terms of your income and your expenditure and um, mm. so because there is that insight that the lender is going to look at things like behavioural spend and how you're managing your finances and I think within the mortgage um, sector then from both a customer and a broker perspective there is a lot of nervousness about the lender accessing that information directly and bypassing you know what, what the broker would do today which is maybe analyze the bank statements to make sure that actually the spending is in line with that lender's credit risk policy in order to to get that uh, application through mm. so we and it's also the availability of the open banking data to the broker Mm. Um, so, you know, the broker will it'll save them a significant amount of time and effort by the use of open banking, but they need the, the same insights to be able to advise, advise their customer and provide guidance in terms of, you know, how to spend appropriately in order to manage your finances to support a mortgage application and the ongoing payments of a mm. mortgage. So, mm. 
it's a very different picture. Um, I think in the mortgage industry, I think what we're starting to see though is some of uh, the new entrants into the mortgage market. You know, they've they've got a bit of a different demographic. Uh, they're targeting a bit of a different demographic, and from there, what we will start to see is a real uptake. Um, in open banking, but just now, you know, we are definitely still in the evolution stage of open banking yeah. within the mortgages. And, and, and Freddie, I suppose you, you said across multiple industries and multiple sectors. I mean, what's what's how do you so you've got a wider view of the market probably? And how have you kind of seen it in terms of take up rates for, for, for on, on the acquisition of the credit side? Yeah, I, th I think it definitely uh, varies by sector and by use case. Mm. Um, one of the things, the trends we've sort of seen in the last 12 months is the obvious stuff that, that people are kind of saying is that you know fintech and, and digitization has always been about getting rid of paperwork and open banking's got a really useful kind of obvious fit for just replacing paper evidence with digital um but the corollary to that is as katie mentions is that there's a certain amount of nervousness in, in particular in certain purchases and, and uh, applications where um you know people are unsure what they're sharing or how much they're sharing um, one of the things that really excites me is that we've, we've kind of moved past the implementation stage. So a year ago and, and before, you know, as you said at the beginning, open banking's existed for a while. We were all sort of talking about, you know, how do we make it and what do the banks have to do to make that happen? And what, you know, what, what are the, the nuts and bolts and the protocols and standards and everything? And now we're talking about use cases. Um, but we're seeing, um, you know, certain sectors that grew massively in, in the lockdown. So things like buy now, pay later and, and retail lending, we see 85, 90% conversion rates um, right. in those kinds of use cases. And obviously that's a, uh, you know, a, an extreme end of the spectrum. But then similarly in, in mortgages, I think there are opportunities around um, kind of um, nurturing customers towards readiness. So some of the clients we work with are, are working with customers that they're acquiring that are perhaps going for their first purchase rather than a remortgage journey. Yeah. Uh, and in those instances, they want to know how they get ready uh, to be uh, accepted. And, and, and open banking has this ability to help them kind of continue to engage with that brand past the sort of acquisition point, and then eventually sort of uh, when they're ready, uh, apply. Uh, and, that, and that's really exciting. And, and how much do you ever think, obviously, the pandemic's had a, a big impact on some of the data that's been captured, particularly some of the bureau data, et cetera. And like, you know, how much, how much do you think open banking is going to be able to sort of help with sort of filling in some of that or adding extra data um, and, you know, I suppose mitigating some of, the, some of the impacts we've had going forward is like fill in, I suppose, for, for some of the impacts and getting extra information from what we haven't seen. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if you just want to comment on that maybe. Yeah, of course. So open banking wasn't even on our agenda prior to the mm. pandemic um, when obviously the payment holiday for parents came into effect and that in turn more or less diluted the, the you know, effectiveness of the traditional credit bureau data mm. that sounds like a lot of lenders have really no choice but to look at alternative means to fairly assess um, loan applications particularly the unsecured world you know we don't have the security to fall back on um, our credit is more at risk in that respect mm. so we've actually fast-tracked it as a solution um, due to that, that recent FCA forbearance and the lack of credit bureau reporting for, for customers in a payment holiday mm. so. and, 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 and I suppose where, where do we go from here I mean what's the um you know, what are, what are the other opportunities that we could potentially use it for? I mean, we're sort of like we're using it to try and gather the information, the information maybe that we've lost from uh, from some of, some of the bureau reporting. But is there is there opportunity to use it in in other ways? Any thoughts on that? I can go on that. Um, I, I think some of the the use cases we've all kind of heard and talked about on on other panels are, relate to the origination. You know, the the nuts and bolts of how do you you know, get enough information to, to make a decision on a customer. And that's obviously really powerful. Um, but there are a bunch of areas after the application and before that, that make open banking really, really interesting. And, and I think it's part of this wider backdrop of moving from uh, kind of sort of snapshotting the customer to this kind of contextual lending mm -hmm. and, and understanding the full picture of the customer. So something like Curve Credit being a great example of that, where we're saying, look, you know, you don't want to necessarily apply for a loan specifically at this point in time, but at some point you might. And we as, an, as a business can kind of help you through that journey by knowing about you and your individual circumstances earlier on. So that can mean providing nudges and uh, information to the individual about how their day-to-day -day behavior um, impacts their ability to apply for credit. Um, but also uh, once they're in a credit agreement, 
helping them use that product effectively. So that might mean uh, automatically uh, arranging the repayments and in fact, transacting them through the open banking payment rails. Mm. Uh, it could also mean for something like a revolving credit product, changing the, the balance of the, the credit product. So changing limits, uh, adjusting payments and, and things like that. So there are a lot of opportunities where you're kind of tying the lending experience with open banking that I think we're just starting to see that are really, really yeah. exciting. We, sorry, from an life oh, perspective, oh. Um, we are, we, you know, just to support that, so open banking is heavily used in the origination space and also in the collection space, but um, where we've identified an opportunity is within the in-life space, so particularly in mortgages, as an example, when we start to go into service in the mortgage account, we have introduced functionality to allow um, our customers to connect to open banking to really help understand their spending behaviour now that they've got their mortgage and actually providing that insight to help them manage their money better mm. and where that is particularly pertinent in the mortgage market is is as they come up to the end of their fixed rate period their two three five fixed rate periods and actually they may be on the cusp of loan to value brackets and it's you know it would be far more beneficial to get into the lower one is to provide them that insight into their day-to-day -day spending which would help them potentially you know make an overpayment uh, towards the capital balance which gets them uh, into that next bracket you know either reducing their monthly installments in or re reducing their term so supporting customers in life within the product cycle out with that is um is an area where we're seeing some real benefits. Yeah, so it's the extra data points as much to, to make a decision from a lending decision point of view, but also then to make the, the relationship more sticky as well. Um, so you're making the relationship more sticky on, on an ongoing basis as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so we talk a bit about, um, talk a bit about, I suppose, open banking use cases, those kind of things. But what about when you decide, I mean, all of you guys are sort of busy being, being putting open banking in. I mean, what about the implementation of it? I mean, what works, what doesn't? Um, you know, it's, it's what, what, are, what, are the, what are the themes that make that, that implementation as easy as possible and some of the, maybe some of the pitfalls to kind of avoid? Yeah, I'll take that one if that's okay. Um, so we've been on this journey very recently. Um, we've seen upwards of, I think, six or seven um, providers of open banking solutions. What we found is the common trends. Um, the providers will, will provide you with the transactional data, so they will provide you with an open banking solution, but that requires a significant part of implementation on our behalf, mm. and going to the big bureau solutions, um, you know, putting that transactional data into a dashboard effectively, into clearly categorised spending habits and things like that, that then an underwriter can quickly assess and make a decision without going line by line which is effectively just a replacement for a bank statement review. Mm. So great for credit risk, terrible for operational efficiency. Mm. Um, the only real provider actually that gives us the full solution is, is Freddie's Credit Kudos. Mm. Um, and there aren't many providers that give us that. So you know, if, if you're looking to go with a, a, a more basic solution, which a lot of people seem to be offering at the minute, you need to be prepared to have some internal IT resource and develop your own dashboards however you want it to present it to your underwriting team or for using your automated decisioning oh. that's the experience we've had anyway uh katie or ellen any 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 kind of thoughts on this i mean because you're going to get a wealth that you get a wealth of extra new data and like how do you utilize that data and how can that be used within your within the rest of your processes yeah i think you know i agree with what's been said the the benefit though is that you know as open banking is relatively new what we're seeing is the providers have um modern tech stacks which mm. in general mean that uh, the actual physical integration is relatively straightforward and quicker in comparison to some of the monoliths of other software mm. that exists um the categorization though is is a tricky part of it um and it, within that you know to one's point in terms of how you're presenting that information to the underwriter or the ultimate decision maker but i think um you know, part of the considerations around that and um this falls into the credit risk world is especially in the mortgage world what we look at is essential and discretionary spend when we're mm -hmm. doing affordability calculations and you know we're starting to see oh is amazon essential or is it discretionary because you can buy pretty much everything from amazon and some of yeah. that can be essential and similarly with um kind of supermarket spending so you know mm -hmm. 
we, you consider the things that you can buy out of Tesco just now. So when you look at that amount, actually, how are you categorising that in that decision making process? Um, and that is a lot of time from a credit risk perspective has to be set, spent not just in how we get it into dashboards, but actually how we're doing that categorisation into what is essential versus dis uh, discretionary spent when making a credit risk, uh, risk decision. Right. I mean, I mean how, and how much data is too much data? I mean, that's kind of kind of brings into that in terms of categorization, looking almost like on a summary level versus almost like raw line, line, line level detail. I mean, how much data is too much data? I mean, is there, I mean, Ellen, you're, you're smiling there because we, we're having this, this, this to and forth uh, earlier. I mean, do we have, is it going to be too much data? I don't believe there's such a thing as too much yeah. data. Now that we've got the storage space for it, that there is there is no bad data. Yeah. Um, and, I've, and I think, the thing is, right now, people are concentrating on open banking for allowing it to do better the things that we were already doing, such mm. as lending, credit management, whatever. There is so much scope to do more. You know, I, I don't think that um, the, the credit industry in this country has caught up yet with the gig economy, mm. with, um, you know, with zero hours contracts, with people having more than one job and se seasonal income, all of those things can be better served with open banking than they are right now and that and then they could ever have been in the past and, and so, so well, yeah give me the data is what i say i, I cannot have too much data and, and so that's that almost like it, it it allows you to then target areas for new lending do you think well not just for new lending but but for the type of lending you know what why shouldn't people have uh, you know a payment holiday over the holidays when they've got their kids at home and they're doing things and they're maybe not earning as much because they're looking after their kids you know mm. as with covid we have seen that doesn't make people less credit worthy mm. it just means that their income isn't as steady as it was yeah so, you know why, why can't we be more adaptable in, in what we lend and when and, and how we receive repayment on that? Hmm. And I think that's that's absolutely the future, but I could bang on about it forever, and I won't, so carry on. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I come in last on, on this, um, and obviously you take what I'm saying with a, a pinch of salt because I suppose I'm selling the shovels, but um, uh, <laughs> the, the, the integration uh, question is always, you know, everyone says you know things are plug and play and you know it's it's really easy and, and I think people are wary of that rightly so um the, the one thing I would say is that um you know the the value of getting the data because it's consented earlier in your kind of overall strategy of open banking is really important because you know it's unlike sort of traditional CRA data for example in that sense because you can't go back and get it for a prior customer. So you, you've got to start collecting that information. And even if you're doing that piecemeal, it's it's going to give you value over a longer period because you're going to start to understand what it is that you want to look for and understand. Um, and so we always try and advise that people don't go for some sort of like big bang, you know, all or nothing release. We try and help them iterate through that process. And I think the other thing from a kind of um, less technical standpoint is the, you know, working with the company, you know, we, we, actively recognize that open banking and more broadly open finance isn't finished yet uh, and it's an evolving process and you know we were talking earlier before the, the call started about the 90-day consent review that's going on with the FCA is just one example we've got variable recurring payments hopefully coming soon and all these things you need a, a company that's going to be agile and, and building new product all the time and and that's where we like to think you know we're, we're adding the most value because we're we're not kind of trying to say, look, this is the finished product. Here you go. We're actually saying, look, we're going to work with you to build what you need. Yeah. I, I wanted to go back just just real quickly to a point that you made, Kate, here around window dressing and window dressing of, um, uh, of, 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 of statements or spending. Yeah. I mean, how much, how much do you think open banking is also open to that? And, and in terms of almost like in terms of uh, even potentially fraud as much as, you know, customers behave, changing their behavior no, in full knowledge, the fact that they're, they're, their, their statements are going to be looked yeah. through and you know does that change with open banking i think i think there's um two schools of thought in this because one is you know it, it happens you know as an industry we accept that it happens but it's if that if they're able to change if their spending habits for a period of three months then actually that could be considered sustainable so actually mm. if they're able to do it for that period then they can continue on and then there is no issue mm. with the the affordability so um, we should rely on that. I think what is interesting is the point about too much data, and I think that's where we see the, the nicking and nervousness around 
the window uh, dressing because they may do it for a period of three months if we if we're going to go back further than that when maybe they weren't doing it in the open banking world i think that's maybe when some um, people think that might be too much data mm. um albeit you know selling point that there are huge benefits uh, in doing that so i think um open banking on the whole is less open to fraud and um what we see in terms of that that window dressing is the same as what we, we would see in bank statements it is just the nervousness around um when someone gives you their bank statements they do it with the control of knowing exactly you're going to see what they see Whereas for consumers and brokers, I think there's a little bit of an unknown mm. in terms of you know how that relates when they start looking at open banking data. And also, it is down to customers to consent what open banking data they provide. And that can be multiple accounts rather than just the one. So um, they may window dress in one account and not the other, which can lead to, um, you know, you can't unsee when you've got it from yeah. a, a regulatory think- perspective. I think that does work both both ways in, in a sense that I mean, you're, you're totally right and it's more of like an education piece but the, you know if the norm is that I send my bank statement as a PDF over email or upload it somewhere then that's kind of there forever whereas open banking I can actually log in to Barclays or whoever and revoke the consent so it's, it is actually giving more control in a sense but consumers just don't yet fully understand how that works I think. I think yeah I think it's it is just it's an evolution um, still and it, it's um, it's about just understanding that dynamic because the broker market is, is sorry, the mortgage market is heavily brokered. So it's that it's about how we how we facilitate the brokers having the same level of control as, as they do today to get them comfortable with it as well as the consumers. Hmm. Um, so so just I mean, and Freddie, you mentioned it before, just a piece around open finance. I mean, just get you to comment a little bit, maybe a bit about that. I mean, so what what other changes do you think we're gonna? That's that's obviously there's, the reviews just come back out. You talked a bit about the ninety day period. I mean, what other what other changes do you do you, do you see down the pipe? Yeah, so um, the FCA response on uh, open finance um, broadly in line with expectation. I, I know uh, we certainly submitted our our thoughts on open finance, and a bunch of other people probably on this call did too. Um, They've said that the natural evolution of open uh, banking is to start, oh, so natural evolution into open finance is to start with other banking products mm. that are already provided by open banking regulated entities. So things like mortgages, savings, um, you know, non-payment accounts that are currently out of the PSD2 scope, I think will be the first areas that we, we see being added. Um, but then there are, obviously we've talked about broader uh, sets of data that could be really interesting. In fact, even credit outcome data, as an example, could be uh, seen under that scope as well. Um, the the thing that's going on in parallel, not to get too much into the, the regulatory weeds, is that the open banking implementation entity is uh, being created as a new thing inside UK finance. And there's a CMA process going on to decide how that works at the moment. And I think it will be really important that that entity and everything that it's learnt around building open banking can carry forward some of the open finance agenda. Mm. Uh, so I, that's my, my sort of hopes next step. And obviously we're staying very close and planning to, to integrate with other uh, data sources as and when they become available. Mm. Okay, I mean, and, and uh, maybe Eleanor, what do you what do you kind of see as being the, the I suppose the future of open banking? Um, um, and particularly, I suppose you know, you can sort of blending it with credit bureaus as well. I mean, what's if you look ahead, what, how do you, how do you kind of, see it working in the process going forward? I think provided there aren't any disastrous uh, data leaks, <laughs> you know, that, that give it a bad press, uh, open banking just plainly is the future of financial um, inclusion and uh, accuracy and assessment. Um, of course, like the Bureau, it still remains backward looking, mm. you know, that the future is going to be predictive analytics based on open banking data. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I mean, we know that, that that's already there in terms of, of credit data. Um, but yes, to be able to predict the future is is where I think it's it's gonna go. And I'm, I'm very pleased at that because ultimately, although it's still predictive, it's, it's a fairer outcome than saying, oh, well, you know, last year you missed a payment, so you're less reliable than this person that hasn't missed a payment but is about mm. to lose their job. Mm. You sort of get a more holistic kind of review. Mm. And, do you, 
there's a question coming in there just in terms of like, do you think it, how, how do you think it's going to interact with some of the more traditional credit bureau type um, uh, type reporting? Do you think it's going to replace some of that or do you think it sort of complements it? Well, I mean, you, you almost can, can draw credit conclusions from open banking anyway because you see people's repayments going out of their bank mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. um, but what it doesn't give you is, for example, a view of people's um, financial uh, relationships with others, which mm -hmm. credit data does. And, and also, the credit data will always have a place, I think, or, although perhaps less so in predicting uh, affordability and, and credit worthiness than, than just pure history of, of being reliable, you know, un, unpaid debts that are, are still outstanding from four years ago might not indicate that you can't afford debt, but it certainly indicates a casual attitude to it. Mm. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, uh, Katie, I mean, what, what, what are, just looking forward to the future, I mean, what, what are your predictions for the next sort of like, you know, one, two, three years in terms of like use of open banking and, and uptake of open banking? I, d I mean, it definitely, you know, it's unmistakably um, on the rise. And as we start to um, see more consumer confidence, um, and I think what we've definitely seen is a kind of demographic um, uptick. Uh, mm. So, you know, we've spent the last 10 years telling people not to give um, anyone their online banking details. And now we're saying, that, you know, give us them and we'll, we'll do all this for you. So mm. we are... Um, We've done lots of years of research into this, and what we're definitely seeing is, you know, as you would imagine, um, the up and coming generation has been more freely accepting to do that, but we've still got a way to go with those people who are, are more traditional. But I do think, you know, when we are talking to new lenders or uh, customers who are looking to, uh, lenders who are looking to soft, swap, swap out their software, then open banking is featuring heavily in what they want. So mm. there's a, there is a desire there. I think, um, you know, it's refreshing to hear Elna from a credit risk perspective um, be, be very supportive of it because I think some of the barriers are in breaking down existing policies that are in place around the more traditional methods of um, income verification. And the types of income that people do and that's changing to you know we spoke a bit about the gig economy but uh, coming out of covid that's going to be far more pertinent mm -hmm. so yeah open banking is definitely the way forward and i think in the next five years it'll be absolute commonplace and mm -hmm. you know in our industry i don't think we'll, we'll, be, we'll be still seeing paper bank statements at all yeah yeah and, and what are your what are your views uh, uh owen yeah no i agree I think the future is is open banking one form or another. I think this is going to fall across underwriting, lending and collections as well. Um, I think it will be really interesting how that manifests itself throughout the customer journey and how firms adopt that um, throughout that customer life cycle in total. And a big part of that will come down to this kind of extension of the 90 days permission mm -hmm. that we have currently. Um, I think the credit bureaus will, will always have a place um, you know, but at the minute, for example, we're going to use a combination hybrid, if you like, of the credit bureau information and transactional data provided by open banking. Mm. And, you know, really it might come down to a, a credit risk assessment as well. So, you know, for example, obviously you don't request supporting documentation for all applications that come through, at least we don't in the unsecured space. Um, I think it will force firms to really reconsider their credit decisioning rules and policies. Mm. Um, you know, for example, have we been unable to verify the applicant's income via the traditional bureau um, tools? If that's the case, okay, then that might trigger, you know, an automated connection to open banking. There is a cost as well to, you know, always keep in mind, it, it does cost every time we want to open up a link for transactional data with open banking as well. So I'm sure firms will consider that. I know that we are. I know that we're not looking to go full out with everybody for open banking. We're going to use a hybrid of the credit bureau data we use and pay for already with perhaps open banking used where we've not been able to verify income or whether there's signs of financial stress or something like that and yeah my view is that the two will probably coexist for a number of years before we probably eventually move to a more self-sustaining open banking tool yeah, yeah i think sorry I, I think just on the that in terms of the complementing you know people will get into or some people will get into financial distress and we'll get that 
information from the Bureau Agency as we do today. However, I think where open banking will serve as a purpose is it'll, it can provide insight into the life circumstances at that point in time. Mm-hmm. So actually, you can make that correlation between the two, and it's Taylor's point about you know an- analytics about future predictions, because if they have experienced a change in circumstances, then actually the open banking data supports that in terms of the reason for a default or a mispayment. Yeah. And actually, what we need to do is become less black and white with that, and and really use that data to support in making pragmatic uh, decisions, and not just you know the computer says no. Well, the probability of recovery from that circumstance as well. I mean, if you can see that there's just no chance, don't don't keep chasing it. Yeah. yeah and I suppose the, the cost the cost of acquisition of that extra data, if it goes down versus say bank statements, the actual cost of actually bringing. I think what you were saying, Owen, it, it means that you can ask for it more often. And does that mean you're going to get, you know, look at more marginal applications? You can sort of will that that kind of change the market in terms of, in terms of those things. I suppose this is where you're looking at new sectors. It sounds like. Absolutely, yeah, and you know it will ultimately help us to make better lending decisions, particularly in the marginal cases. Mm. Um, how that manifests itself in in terms of lending will be really interesting as the wider industry begins to take up on it. You know, will we see lending decline, for example, because we're now seeing information that we never saw before, and mm. we're making decisions based on that? Will it go the other way? Will firms have more confidence in the marginal cases? Will we be able to lend because you know we're able to? To Elena's point, we're not basing a decision based on a historic default. We're basing it on their current circumstances, pragmatically looking and see whether they can afford monthly repayments or not. Mm. Um, I, I think that will be really interesting in the next few years as we yeah. see more uptake. And, I, and sorry, I, I do think they're going to change how they use credit as well. And the first place in which we'll be able to see that change happening is in the open banking data. It won't be in the credit data. Mm. And, and just bring Freddie in just to, I suppose, just close in terms of like, you know, from a from a roadmap point of view, I mean, you talked a bit about the reviews, some of the things that are, that are on, the, on the horizon, but where, where do you where do you kind of see it see it going? And you talked about having this incremental approach, um, but I mean, have you got any other any other thoughts on where we'll end up with this? Yeah, I think in, in the immediate term, it's kind of just as, as Owen described, really, you, you as a sort of lending business have got this pie chart of, you know, the costs that you spend on onboarding a customer and, and I think over time with more understanding and uh, more tooling around open banking and open finance more of that pie chart can be sort of satisfied with that data and therefore you know the the cost will make more sense and therefore there'll be greater adoption further up the funnel um, so I think in the kind of medium term that's that's what we're thinking about um, but then there's also this kind of uh, other use case question like we're, we're really interested in sort of like the net new products mm. rather than just sort of how do we improve existing processes and i think that's what that's what's getting everyone really excited you know there are customers that currently are unreached or harder to reach or you know maybe pay more that we can all do more intelligent things around how we lend to them to make sure that they they get the right product and it's affordable and uh, responsible and and all those good things and i think that the nature of open banking and the fact that it's real time gives us that flexibility and i think you know Good examples of that, like uh, Eleanor raised earlier, uh, Uber drivers. You know, we we have been working with the guys at Drover, now part of Kazoo for for a number of years, and they started you know providing vehicles to Uber drivers, right? And and it, it's very difficult to use a credit bureau to to, to kind of understand the income patterns of those people because it's fluctuating. But you can use open banking really effectively, and it's really easy for them to just do it through the app, and and they're done. So these kinds of products that you know serving a new type of individual uh, will be more prominent. So it seems as far as we've come over the last year, although there was there before a year or longer, it sounds like we've still got quite a way to go. I mean, it's, it's been a great last year in terms of getting extra adoption, but there's still more that we can do. I, I think so. I mean, it's one of those things people, what's, what's the phrase? People sort of overestimate what they can do in one year, but underestimate what they can do in five or something like that. I don't you know, I'm probably butchering that. But, but you know, now that we've got the, the standards, we've got everything working. You know, I do think that, and we've seen with the adoption curve in the last you know, couple of months, we, we added more open banking users in the last six months than we had like in the entire period previously, or you know, close mm-hmm. to. And so it, it will, you know, suddenly happen, not not so gradually. And, and I think that's where we are right now. Mm. Okay, well, th- well, thanks everyone for the call. Well, we, there were a couple of questions that came through that I'm going to go back. I, mean, I don't know who wants to take this. I mean, just around a bit of advice on strategies and lenders that can use to get more people to adopt open banking. Uh, I don't know if someone wants to, to, to maybe just take that for the for the for the group. Any thoughts on how you can sort of drive up adoption? 
Yeah, I can jump in on that one. It's something that we're looking at now, obviously, being new to the open banking game and implementing it. Um, one of the things we're looking at is incorporating it into our application journey. Hmm. Um, you know, so it's presented at the point where they are, are referred for manual decisioning, perhaps. And then as well, having a great um, automated contact strategy in place. So you present them with the option, you know, during the, the website, during the application. And then if they click off or they don't click it immediately for whatever reason, you then have a really robust, coherent contact strategy, probably on the channel, SMS, email, phone call, potentially, to just improve that, um, well, to, to get them to click the link, basically, and sign up to it. And then almost selling the benefits as well. So really carefully explaining why you're asking for permission, what it will be used for the benefits to the customer you know it makes the, the lending decision fairer it could reduce resulting lower payments whatever it may be and just being really really clear about that because you know people most part consumers aren't, aren't too used to this they use open banking but they don't know that they use it the majority of people um you know they don't know how well connected their bank account is to open banking their monzos their starlings things like that so being really clear about um you know how the information will be used and the benefits the, the customer would be key in my view Hmm. So it's almost like the, the utility bit. I mean, Katie or Ellen, any any kind of last views on that, or in terms of how to drive up adoption? We're doing a similar thing. You know, we we prompt to be open banking as our first port of call with all our interactions, both from a mortgage application and collections perspective, to push the customers down that and advise of the benefits in terms of their time and the time of the overall process, um, and give them the assurances that they require through you know good information good Q&As based on um, actual user feedback as to why they're not using that service and um, alleviating customer concerns, which mainly focus around security and fraud. Mm. Um, so, you know, it is just education. I think also coverage. We have to bear in mind open banking is not fully covered yet. You know, not, not every bank account has it. And, uh, and that is a huge issue because until it is you know very very much almost 100 percent covered it won't be seen as normal we, we have to normalize it and, and educate people in that way of this is this is nothing to be afraid of this is what people do now yeah yeah these things these things take time well um everyone thank you very much and i, and I really sort of um uh, appreciate everyone having the taking taking the time today i think it's a fascinating discussion as, as freddie you, you were saying it feels like yeah we've come a long way but there's still more opportunity out there and you can see by just some of the developments in terms of you know increasing response rates further analysis of the data you can use that from a from a, from a lending point of view as well as sort of downstream uh, stickiness for customers as well which i thought was particularly interesting so um so everyone thank you very much and uh, a really appreciate fascinating conversation really so uh colin i think i think that we've got a break now for folks until um 12 50 i think is the next one isn't it uh, one, 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 one o'clock for the next is it one o'clock is it yeah yeah no it's fine no, no, th thanks Always everybody. Early. That's really good um, and, and critical. Um, I think it, it, for me, it's always because I've, I've kind of crossed into lending and collections, hearing about um, the adoption of lending, and it, it's still, you know, um, not the norm, uh, which is sometimes I, I think it can be assumed that it, it's fairly normal now for lending to adopt uh, open banking. So that's really interesting. Uh, I'm obviously the slowness of it being adopted in collections obviously it's more complex but really interesting from my point of view in, from that perspective and hopefully our audience as well um obviously great thanks chris for leading on that and obviously uh katie ella owen and freddie for your insight that's really good um hopefully we've got some really good um comeback in, in terms of our survey poll as well which you're running for out because that that'd be good a couple of questions as well which we're, we're trying to cover off um in our review um but I'd, I'd like to end by thanking um, everybody, everybody who contributed to this event. Obviously, everybody who viewed it, Credit Kudos in particular, who uh, sponsored this event as well. That was fantastic, this session. Um, yeah, so we're going to leave, leave you all for now. For those of you who joined us at Fraud, that begins at 1 o'clock. Um, and for everybody else, I just want to say thank you for tuning in. And, and thank you to our speakers. And we'll see you all again soon. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.